now we'll jump onto certain basic configurations uh, which are which cannot be done through those wizards and what are the various verifications that can be done after the entire configuration is completed so again uh, we will start since we're on the smc we'll start with the smc itself we'll go to the client the client that we are pretty used to that is right this is a java GUI client we'll jump onto the administrative appliance basically the configuration part of the smc instead of the dashboard now this page looks very similar to other three appliances it gives you the details about the smc the basic how what is the system on which it's being deploy, deployed and what is the load it's going through it all the details will come on the first page itself so just to take the dns configuration we'll go to the dns that's naming and the dns all right it says that this is my domain name it shows that it's a dns server all right so it asks for network host and ip lookup this is where we can do the check let me mention the ip of that particular workstation let's see if our smc is able to resolve this particular ip address uh, do a arpa lookup and find out using the ptr record and find out what is this ip which particular machine is using this ip it should be a workstation let's see and it's retrieving the dns records it says succeeded and it's able to find out yeah using a ptr record it does an arpa in address arpa resolution for the ip that we have given and it finds out that it's for workstation 47 so your dns is working fine that's check number one check number two you have to check another important part is ntp whether your ntp is working fine or not so the easiest method to check the ntp in all the devices is using audit logs so by default uh, every hour your ntp server resync happens the moment your device boots up an ntp server is mentioned a resync happens and uh, it the resync happens with uh, after every resync it displays a very specific message let me share that particular message with you share the message let's see if the first thing happens so this message system time reset This message should come every hour minimum. So if this message notice the time 1507, 1607. So if this message is not coming in after every hour, this means that something is wrong with your NTP server and your device is not NTP sync. In case that uh, if this device becomes out of sync in the NTP and there'll be a gap of one hour before we'll be able to recognize this if we use this particular method. So we can access, we can log in into the CLI. That's where the SSH is being used. We can log into the CLI and see if our NTP is on sync. Let's log into the CLI of the SMC. Root is a default username that comes with the box. It's not created by me. So we'll log into the IP. That's 198.18.128. The default password is LAN one cope. This is how your SMC CLI looks like. Now we need to see what is the hardware clock, whether this clock is correct or not. The command is HW clock show. It tells you whether this is the time and the clock according to the device. If this is according to your correct, that's good. If it's not, you can force it to sync it with the NTP then and there 
command is ntp date and mention your ntp server after that my ntp server is ending with dot one the moment uh, your ntp sync happens it gives you a successful message if it doesn't happen it gives you an unsuccessful message so in this scenario it says ntp date adjust time server offset yeah so the your force ntp sync was successful and to look at the message when it's not successful let's mention a wrong ntp server there's no ip with this uh, there's no there's no user or there's no device in this particular ip we're just mentioning it so that we need to see the message and how when what happens when the ntp sync fails it gives you a clear cut message that ntp sync was unsuccessful or sync didn't happen so synchron uh, no su no server suitable for a synchronization fab it gives you a corresponding correct message so this is the configurations that we have to look for in the smc these are the three basic checks once a system is being deployed uh, post these checks there are certain configurations that need to be done for the flow sensor specifically since flow sensor is responsible for creating the net flow exporters and sending it through by looking at the actual traffic this means flow sensor have far more control as compared to other net flow exporters since it looks at the actual traffic instead of looking at just those net flow data so let's go inside the configurations and let's first check whether flow sensor knows if the flow collector to which it's sending the traffic to exist or not so configuration net flow, flow collectors it should know that it should be able to send the traffic to flow collector it should give me those details here and yes this is the flow collector ip send it to default port of 2055 now let's look at the advanced configurations on what all traffic does a flow sensor can send to the flow collector so as a recommended practice we always say that your export packet payload should be enabled this way uh, it's a way of saying that it can look at the raw traffic and send part of that particular raw traffic along with the net flow so that the stealth watch management console have more information to process and it can give you more accurate results as well as it can detect the threats more easily the second option tells us that uh, export the application identification basically it tells it gives the flow sensor its ability to perform deep packet inspections since it can look more than what what are the contents of the packet instead of just port in the protocol so it can perform the DPA and find out what kind of a traffic is flowing through. As an example, if a port TCP port 80 traffic is flowing through the uh, through the uh, virtual machine, this gives an impression that it's only used for web browsing, but it can also be used for web chatting. Once this option is enabled, it can look at the application that's that's using that particular uh, port and protocol along with the packet and on the basis of that, it can give those details to the Stealth Watch Management Console. Uh, we tell all the customers that to do enable this option, even though if you're not using IPv6, is because it gives Flow Sensor the ability if any IPv6 uh, threat is coming in, so that Flow Sensor can detect it easily. Uh, include HTTPS header data. It includes data such as certificates for signing or encrypting. Uh, this option include HTTP, HTTP header data. This includes data such as the URL, uh, the data such as commands as used in FTPs, SNMPs. It allows that to collect those data, those commands, and send it along with the along with the NetFlow exporters to the SMC or the flow collector. Uh, by default, is 32 bytes. That's 32 bytes of the initial HTTP request packets can be sent out. We can increase this to our choice, but with every data, with every byte we increase here, flow sensor have to take an extra load in fetching those data and putting them in the Netflix portal and sending it through. So we have to be very careful while increasing the data. A proper monitoring needs to be done when increasing each and every byte. So these are the basic, these are the recommended practices, but these all checkboxes needs to be enabled. Uh, we'll click on apply let's move on to the udp director 
All right. In the UDP director, the purpose of UDP director is to able to collect the data from many sources and channel them to the flow corrector or a stealth watch management console depending upon the data. So when we say channel, this means there needs to be certain rules on the basis of which it defines that this data needs to go to this device. Those rules are called forwarding rules. So let's create a couple of forwarding rules. Uh, we will send all the netflow data to the flow collector and all the syslog data to the stealth watch management console. So let's create these forwarding rules. Forwarding all netflow to flow collector. Uh, it tells us it tells us that how do we classify this entire data? Uh, it's pretty simple that data coming from any IP at port 2055 uh, to which to to which uh, appliance we have to send this data to. It of course it has to be flow collector since 2055 is a default port for the NetFlow. It's 198.18.128.137. The destination port number uh, we have given 2055 flow collector by default and the way it's configured the way it's being designed is flow collector can listen on only one port by default that port is 2055 we can change that port to a custom defined port but the option is the only constraint is that only one port can be enabled so udp director is a good in the sense that it allows uh, the NetFlow exporters to be able to send the NetFlow data on multiple different ports and the UDP director can create a single channel from from itself to the flow collector to send the entire data through. Alright, we'll click on apply. This is the data being formed specifically for the flow collectors in the data all the net for traffic, all the net for traffic coming on port 2055, send it to the flow collector on port 2055. Now the next rule we'll create is all the traffic, all the syslog traffic that's coming, send it to your SMC. So basically forwarding all the customer syslog to SMC coming from any IP from port to 5 and 4 that's the default one send it to the SMC that's IP is 198.18.128.136 port number is 514 apply All right. Now your SMC will your now your sorry now your UDP director will be able to send all the traffic. All I've written this wrongly. Forwarding all those. Okay, here it is. Forwarding all the syslog traffic to the SMC coming from all the IPs on port five and four. Send it to this. Uh, send it to the SMC IP on port five and four. Uh, there are certain scenarios such as there are multiple flow collectors. Uh, being used in the network and we can we can create a range here itself that for traffic coming from these are netflow exporters send it to a certain flow collector and another rule we can create is a traffic coming in from another range send it to the another flow collector the only common problem that happens to the customer is that UDP director can receive the traffic from many sources but if there's no forwarding rule being created to send the traffic to the corresponding flow collector, then the entire traffic is a waste. And that's a common issue. So we need to be careful. We, do, we don't fall into that, such a pitfalls. Uh, the scenarios where multiple flow collectors are being used, they can be such as if there are uh, 100,000 flows per second, then a single flow collector cannot handle it. A UDP director can, but a flow collector cannot handle it. In such cases, we need multiple flow collectors. 
and we have a complete control over the UDP director on the basis of a port, the IP from the traffic and to which device we want to send the traffic to. So this entire course, uh, in, this sec in this section of the course, we have learned how do we do the configurations, basically using the tools, the wizard, and what are the extra configurations that's needed apart from those wizards. And lastly, what are the basic checks that needs to be performed in all the Stealth Watch appliances to make sure your system is working properly. Thank you.